Welcome to another edition of the History of the World. My name is Alan Abel, and I would like to tell you about the relationship of the snare drum and its effect on civilization today. Many people have asked, where did this drum really come from? Well, last year, an archaeologist friend of mine went to Egypt, and after poking among the pyramids for over six months, he discovered that this particular drum actually came from a music store in Greenwich, Connecticut. However, the drum does date back to the year 4000 BM, which of course is before Madonna. Now in that year, we had cavemen who used to use the drum as a means of communication. They would first of all cut down a tree, hollow out the log, cover the end of that log with the skins of neighboring tribes, and then beat on the end of that log with an arm or a leg from one of the tribes. And of course, we developed our first log rhythms that way. Now, we would have one tribe talk to another tribe by using a drum book. They actually had a drum book. For example, let's have a woman in a tribe over here who wants to talk to a lady in a tribe three miles away. She would look up her number in the drum book, and it might be three, two, one, roll twice. So she would send the number. Her friend would hear the, the number on the drum and know that she was wanted on the drum. So she would get out her drum and go up to the top of a mountain, two, three miles apart, and they could talk to each other in this manner. This is just an ordinary conversation. They're talking about the weather, a new tribe in the village, and how dirty their cave is. One woman is asking the other about the, the new doctor in the village. The other woman wants to know which doctor. That's the one. She's talking about the dirty spear that he uses and how she refused to allow him to give her a shot for her Neanderthal measles. Oh yes, they're talking about the concert with the Brontosaurus Chorus, the song that everybody loved, which was called, Who is Going to Bite Your Neck, Dear, When All of My Teeth Are Gone, and other such trivia. Now, let us suppose we have a young boy in a tribe, and he knows a young girl in a tribe, and he wants to talk to her. He'll get out his drum, and he could send a message like this to his lady friend two, three miles away. Translated into English, the message says to her, Marcia, if your tribe is ever captured by our common enemy and they happen to burn you at the stake, it couldn't happen to a nicer girl. Well, she would return a message to him. Saying, John, I don't know what I'd do without you, but I'd rather. After the drum was used as a means of communication, it began to be used as a means of marching. The troops would take their drums out and march to a different beat, which of course basically is left, 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 right, left, unless you have two left feet, then it's all lefts. But different countries have symbolic drum beats that they march to. For example, in England, the drummers there play on the drum head and on their drum sticks as well, like this. That's in England. Now in Spain, the drummers march and play on the drum head under their arms with their sticks up in the air like this. That's in Spain. Now in France and Germany, well, let's take Germany, as they say in Russia. During the Second World War, when the German troops were marching into France, the German soldiers marched to a very sinister and famous Nazi drumbeat that went like this. Now, while the German soldiers were marching into France, 
the French soldiers were marching out of the country. And they, of course, marched out to a very symbolic French drumbeat that went like this. Now, they were in rather a hurry to get out of the country. Drama has continued on through the centuries as a means of supplying music. In fact, this drum really is a musical instrument. And to prove that, I'm going to play a classical selection for you now by the spirited composer Shenley. Now, this is Shenley's fifth symphony. And the first movement was written for the snare drum and the E-flat syringe. Very difficult movement because it's been transcribed for the trombone. However, I'm going to play it for you just as I recorded it last week for Victor, my younger brother. And the first movement will be played at twice the speed of sound. <clears throat> Now, the second movement actually tells a story. Imagine, if you will, a castle over in England. Lady Fortissimo has just overpowered Lord Pianissimo and actually strangled him. As the movement begins, she's dragging the body over to the dumbwaiter. However, he refuses to be involved in this crime. So she stuffs the body into their Mahatma Gandhi dresser, which has two legs and no drawers. Now, down in the courtyard, there's a heated gun battle going on between William Tell and a notorious criminal known as Louis the Weasel. This is what happened. The drum can do a lot of things. It has a lot of effects. It not only can just go bang, 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 it can also go boom, boom. And boom, bang, boom, and bang, boom, bang. So it is a very versatile instrument. And probably the two most important notes in drumming are these two. Because without those two, where would this be? Now this is a, a bolero. Ravel's Bolero proving that the drum can be a very dangerous instrument to play. In the orchestra today, when the drummer plays the Ravel's Bolero, he usually passes out from exhaustion because this drum part goes on and on. Nothing but this, the same thing, over and over, hour after hour. There are many composers who think that Ravel's mimeograph machine got stuck or that he had the hiccups. So it makes this part very difficult for one drummer to play. Usually two or three drummers play it. Another drum part very difficult to play is uh, a part from rimsky korsakov Scheherazade that goes like this. Now notice how I have to lean into the drum. You can't get all the notes in unless you lean in as I did. Drummers come along to that part, lean into it, and go right over into the string section. Very embarrassing for the violinists. Then there's a, a third drum part that is really impossible to play from Aaron Copland's Outdoor Overture. In fact, it's so impossible that obviously I can't play it. But I thought you might like to know about it anyhow. In the event that our Conrad system, our civil defense system fails, the government of the United States plans to use the drum for a means of communication. In other words, it's very conceivable that they will follow suit learning from the Indians that this was, in fact, a message center. The drum can be used to transmit messages. And the Indians even ex ex experiment with rainfall. Uh, a bunch of um, Ch Cherokee Indians would get up on tree branches and pretend to be a high pressure area. A bunch of others would lie down on the ground, pretend to be a low pressure area. And then they take out their drums and start beating them and dance like hail in order to influence rain. Now, it usually didn't work, but they had a lot of fun. Also, the drum was used between the Indians and white people, of course, as a means of overcoming the language barrier. An Indian would go into a, a trader's store, a white trader's store, and uh, send a message <laughs> saying, I want fire water. And the white trader would answer back, we do not serve Indians. And the Indian would respond, I did not order an Indian. 
Now, in the case of the government, when Ronald Reagan, our president, wants to alert the nation that, in fact, our country is under nuclear attack and the Conrad's warning system has been knocked out, you will hear this message coming from the White House. Translated into English, the message says, this is your president speaking. I have just been awakened from my nap to learn that our country is under attack and that your government is in hiding. Will somebody please tell me where they are? One of the questions that have been asked of drummers has been, what do drummers think about while they're playing? You see rock drummers in the band, you see drummers playing on television, and you wonder, what do they think about? Well, all drummers, of course, come from the same mold. It's just that some are moldier than others and think accordingly different things. There are those drummers who think that they are in great pain, that it really hurts them to play. And you can see that if you watch their faces closely when they play like this. That's very painful. Then there are other drummers who play and they think they are amazing. And you can see that if you watch them because they play like this. Amazing. The final group of drummers are bored. They just want to go home. They're very tired. And you can tell if you watch them because they play like this. One stick only. And now the other stick. And still another stick. And now the impossible. No sticks. Impossible. But now I would like to show you the political influence of, of drumming. And for that particular demonstration, I'm going to need some assistance. So I'm going to turn to my right here and select one, two, three young ladies who have been waiting very patiently. And let us start with, with Nina on this end. Uh, Nina, if you would come up here and perhaps if uh, Jacqueline could hand me that bag, because I don't want to stretch our microphones too far. Thank you kindly. If you could come up here. This is Nina Jaroslav. Is that yes. pronounced yes, properly? Yes, that's proper. That's that is right. proper pronunciation. Now, what we're going to do here, Nina, we're going to demonstrate that anybody can actually perform a useful function in our government when it comes to sending important communication signals. And you are going to be part of our team that will demonstrate to our viewers out there how anybody can walk in, pick up an instrument, and suddenly they are part of this communications network that we're Great. supplying. Okay. Now, I'll just put you in charge of this particular instrument here called the cowbell. Take your left hand finger there to hold on. Mm -hmm. Hang on tightly to that. I got it. You don't drop it. Then, pardon me, with this stick held firmly in your right hand, okay, now a little tighter around there. Now hold this cowbell up in this manner here. Oh. And you're going to strike it right on top to the expression, I like Edwin Meese. Now we keep going, don't oh. stop. No. Very good, that's your rhythm. Now remember that, don't forget it. And stand back to the side for a second. Okay. And let's go on and ask for Diane. Was it with a hard T, Thoban or Tobin? Soft T, Thoban. So we say Thoban, I wanna get that straight. Right. Diane, let's give you this particular instrument called the claves, in which your left hand is held like this. And this, now keep your fingers down. This fits right there, this is on the right. And uh, think of that, phrase, shave, haircut, two bits. Did you ever hear that? No. 
Well, you're hearing it right now. It's shave, haircut, two bits. Keep saying it over and over and strike right in the center. And don't drop that. Okay, remember that. Now, you stand aside a bit too, about a foot, and we'll ask Jacqueline, Jacqueline Ramel, to join us in that position. And the instrument that we've chosen for you is called the, the guiro. And what you have to do, Jacqueline, is one finger here and one there, if you can reach mm -hmm. that in this manner. All right, that's it. Now, this is held with this portion. Now, what you have to do is scratch mm -hmm. this very deeply and think of the, the words Ronald Reagan on each syllable. So it's Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan. Try this. Very steady and deep. You've got it. Hold it, hold it. Now, don't forget that. But I'm going to count to four. Then each of you come in with your respective rhythms. Now, don't listen to one another. And okay. keep going. And I'll join you. And we will now send out the perfect message to all those who are listening, proving that just about anybody can communicate. That's our message. You ready? Four counts for nothing. All right, nice and strong. One, two, three, four. Very good. Thank you. Put your instruments down, if you will, please. And then let's find out who you people really are, because we've had you speaking with us on the history of the world, but we don't really know. Jacqueline Ramel, who are you and what Ramel. are you doing? Pardon? Ramel. Okay. Yeah. I said Ramel. Yeah. Would you rather have the accent no. on Ramel? No, Ramel. Like, like Ramel the desert fox? Who? Uh, never <laughs> no, met him, did you? <laughs> yes. I don't know. No, no. I didn't meet him, but I know the Desert Fox. The Desert right. Fox is a historic, I might as well tell you because you, you should know its history. Mm -hmm. Rommel was a general in the German army during World War II. And he was known as the Desert Fox because he had a way of going into the desert and, and burrowing like a fox in the sand with tanks. And, and he was a fox. He was in many ways. Yeah. Yes, but he was. Yes, human being. Human being. Uh -huh. So tell us, who, who are you and what do you do? Oh, that's, that's a big question. <laughs> I, you are an actress. Uh, I'm Jacqueline Ramel, and uh, I'm an actress, yes. And I'm from mm -hmm. Sweden. And you are from Sweden? Stockholm. So you have a dual passport, or are you just visiting here? No, I have a, a dual passport. Dual, both Sweden and America. Oh, no, no, just Swedish. Mm -hmm. But I have a H-1 visa, working visa, so. Uh, you're not wanted by any country? You're not one of these noted no, no, criminals? No, 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 don't worry. Oh, don't good, worry. good. I'm, and, I'm uh, clean. And you're not dangerous, a dangerous person. That is to say, it you're not. It depends what you mean. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, you, no. you seem like a very nice, uh, down-to-earth type person. You're not about to, to pick up a, one of these instruments and, you know, and beat us over the head with it. That's what No, I'm, just to play with them. Just, OK, fine, good. And your goal is to uh, to act then. To act, yeah, mm -hmm. that's my life. To be discovered and perform on stage. Or to discover myself. Motion pictures. Was, uh, yeah. Perhaps. Yeah, film and stage both. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't go into one thing. Um, so you are you are going to diversify, as they say. You diversify. You're going to spread your talents around. Yeah. Ah. Uh, okay. Well, how would you sum up your life in terms of your tombstone? What would you like? to have your final stone say, if, if you could choose a few words. To have my, oh, my goal, you mean? Well, <laughs> what would you like the world to remember you as, since this is the history of the world, and as a we're dealing in history? Unforgettable actress. An unforgettable <laughs> actress, <laughs> which could be taken many different ways. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Diane Tobin, come over here by me, and we'll change places with you. Thank you, thank you very much. Miss America. And uh, you're <laughs> also an actress? Yes. And what else do you do? I... That's play good. Flutes. <laughs> I annoy That's people. Fine. Uh, That's fine. Well, uh, I, a lot of different things. You do a lot of things. Yes. Do you do windows? 
my own sometimes. Oh, but not others. You make house calls, fix plum. You're not a plumber. I mean, you have no. a, a snake. You said you had a snake before. A snake. Yeah. Somebody yeah. said they had a snake. Yeah. Oh, you I had a bow constrictor. All right. I don't know. I, I okay. Connection. Okay. We're we're going to, to see a lot more of you, hopefully, on television and films. Perhaps People Magazine. No, not People Magazine. Films no. would be good, but not People <laughs> Magazine. Okay. Thank you again for being with us today as a performer in many ways, and your past programs, too. Oh, thank you. And we'll see more of you, hopefully. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. All right. Now we'll take place with Nina Jaroslav. It's me. All right, Nina. And you are an actress, yes. performer. Yes, an actress, singer, and a singer. A dancer. And, and a dancer. Uh, you all dance, I understand. Uh, yeah. Well, what we'll do, uh, you dance. Uh, have you danced at uh, Studio 54, Limelight? No. You don't go to. I've danced at Limelight. I've been to Limelight. Studio 54 is kind of on the way when I, when I came mm -hmm. I've been to New York. After Where, after what do you want to be when you grow up? When I grow up. Yeah, do you get that want, question? Well, growing up, yeah, I do. In you fact, do. people say that to me all the time. Oh, and, that's uh, not nice, really. I just did it frivolously. No, but they do ask me that. And mm -hmm. I usually say, in response to that, I, if, what, if, the, if growing up means settling down and being sort of stayed and. Mm -hmm. And, and boring, then I okay. don't want to grow up. <laughs> all right, we're not. We're going to allow you none of you three to grow up by first of all asking you to remove your mics, and I'm going to supply the room. We're going to dance out of okay. the history of the world on your toes. Ready? Get set. You're on. <laughs> 